morning to everyone and welcome to the well here at STSA. All those who are joining us here in the room in Arlington, those who are across the camera in Leesburg, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a special message today, not part of a series, just a one-off. And the title, as you see up there on the screen, is A Single Act of Courage. And this is a message that is from my heart and it's based on two events that took place this past week. So I'm gonna give you where the, 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 the context of where this message came from and then we'll get into the message. Two things happened last Sunday, Sunday and Monday, that led to what I'm about to speak about. First is last Sunday obviously was a very important day as we celebrated the feast of Pentecost. Very good, not much energy, but that's okay. Say it again, say Pentecost. Pentecost, very good. That's the day the Holy Spirit came on mankind. That's the day when God's spirit was given to all of flesh. We all became sons and daughters of God. And that is the same spirit that came on us, the same spirit that was inside Jesus. So right off the bat, I'm thinking to myself, if the spirit that was in Jesus is inside me, my life needs to look more like Jesus's life. My life can't be ordinary. My life can't be pathetic. My life can't be plain old and run of the mill and mundane because Jesus had the same spirit inside him and his life was anything except all of those things. So if my life is ordinary and my life is plain and my life is boring and my life isn't in, in some way extraordinary, then either there's a problem with the Holy Spirit or there's a problem with me and we agreed during the liturgy today that problem is clearly with me. That's number one. The second thing that happened is I received a visit last week from a spiritual mentor of mine. And that is His Grace Bishop Paul. Who, for those who know, he's the Bishop of Mission and he serves in Africa. And he is one of the people that is most responsible for who I am today spiritually. Because he was the one who showed me that there was more to the spiritual life than just praying and reading the Bible. And there's more to the spiritual life than just go to church on Sundays. And more to the spiritual life, and the greatest sacrifice that you'll ever make isn't going to Taco Bell and saying, hold the cheese, please, <laughs> during the fasting. He showed me that the spiritual life, the life with Christ, is more like being part of an army, is more like being on a mission than it is being part of a country club. And he used to have this famous sentence that he used to say, that he used to say, do something crazy for the Lord. Okay, do something crazy. And we would be there. I went on mission trips. I, I got to know him. Uh, I went on a mission trip in 1998, 2000, 2002, 2004, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2010, 2015. And then I always got to hang out with him anytime he came right here. And every time he boosts my spirit. And from the very beginning, that 1998 trip, which was 25 years ago, he said, do something crazy for the Lord. And we would say, you know, but, you know, your grace, if we do this, this could happen. And he said, do something crazy for the Lord. And that was kind of his thing. Well, I'm putting both of those things together. Number one, the Pentecost, receiving the Spirit. And the life before the Spirit can't be the same as life after the Spirit. Add on top of that vi a visit from a very inspiring Bishop Paul who always makes me encouraged and excited and motivated to do stuff. And that's where we get today's message. And today's message, one key thought, and that key thought is this. A single act of courage is often the difference between an ordinary and an extraordinary life. A single act of courage is often the difference between an ordinary and an extraordinary life. I have a theory. My theory is that every one of us is born wanting to be great, wanting to be significant, wanting to make a difference in the world. That's why we love superhero movies. That's why we love James Bond movies. That's why we love sports stories and heroes. We love people who don't just nine to five, you know, 2.2 kids with 2.2 picket fence or whatever it may be. We love people who make a difference and who do something bold and do something courageous and the world is a better place because of it. We all have that inside desire to do that. That's why when you ask kids from a young age, what do you want to be? I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be, you know, a, a, a sports star. I want to be, no one says I want, with all due respect, not to, but no one says I want to be, you know, uh, I don't want to make fun, actuary. Okay, or no one says, I want to be a hygienist at a, a like, you know when that happens? Something happens, uh, nothing against the hygienist, okay? It's, it's a great field, anything like that, but I didn't know where to go because we have a very diverse group right here, so I was going to say insurance salesman, but I don't know. Anyway, something happens to us as we get older, and I think it's around middle school because anything bad in this world happens in middle school, okay? That's the, 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 the lowest point in life. In middle school... Before that, like I said, I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be something great. And then something happens in middle school where our goal is no more to be great. 
Our goal is to blend in, to be as ordinary as possible, to stick out as little as possible, because middle school is when kids are mean and kids make fun of. There was a movie called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Anyone seen Diary of a Wimpy Kid? Okay, I used to watch it on the airplanes when I would watch it. And, 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 and in, there's a scene in it where the little guy goes to middle school and his older brother in high school is advising him. And he's saying the way of the world. Okay, and he gives him very clear instructions for his first day. And he says this, quote, don't talk to anyone, don't look at anyone, don't go anywhere, don't raise your hand, don't go to the bathroom, don't choose the wrong locker, don't get noticed, don't do anything. And I believe that while middle school may be long past us at this point, for some of us way long past us, I think the effects still linger on. Because I think many live today to be as ordinary as possible, to stick out as little as possible. To go through, I call it the moving walkway of life. You know that moving walkway in the airports where you're just going, okay, and you don't have to walk. It just kind of pushes you along, and you just like, you know, like this. That's the way some of us live in life, okay? And the goal is to go to college, to get the degree, to get the job, to get the house, to get the wife or the husband, to get the kids, to then give them a house, to give them a wife, and just going through the, and just going through the motions. As if the goal of life is just to get to the end safely. Well, I got news for you. You're going to get to the end. You're going to make it to the end. The goal isn't to get to the end of life as safely as possible doing nothing along the way. The goal is what happens between here and the end. And I realize, I realize that while this is inside of us, this, this, this desire to be great that's, that, 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 that is kind of pushed down by the world and says, just be ordinary. Then all of a sudden, someone like me comes along and, and has a sermon like today, or you read it in a book, or you have this gut feeling inside you like, maybe I was made for something more. What is my purpose? Like of all the 8 billion people on the planet, what does God want from me? And that little voice may come up inside you. And I realize that's not an easy answer, a question to answer. I realize that I'm not going to pretend I'm going to give you the answer in the next 30 minutes. I'm not going to give you the answer. My, my problem is not that we don't have the answer. My problem is that we're not asking the question. Because we've set the bar so low that the answer doesn't even matter. Saying that the goal of life is just to get to death safely. Saying that the goal of Christianity is just go to church, try to avoid like doing anything bad, try not to adultery or murder anyone, try not to do those things, okay, and, and give a, a couple of bucks to the homeless guy at the traffic light. If that's your idea, if that's what like, the goal is, that's like saying the goal of marriage is just to not get divorced. The goal of marriage, where's my wife, okay? The goal of marriage, my goal in our, in our marriage is that, uh, you know, I never steal from you, okay, that uh, I, I buy you flowers on our anniversary and I take out the recycling every Thursday, is that the goal of marriage? No. And it's not the goal of this marriage. And it's not the goal of life in Christ. I think there's got to be more. And I say it this way. I'd say this. I read this in a book one time. I don't remember who said it. But it says, we aren't in danger of ruining our lives. We're in danger of wasting them. We aren't in danger of ruining our lives. We're in danger of wasting them. I'm talking about people specifically inside the church. The people outside the church, yeah, they're the bad people. They're ruining their lives. But you're good people. We're good people. We're not ruining our lives. We're not doing bad stuff. We're doing all the right things. But in the end, we may be wasting our lives. There was a book that's called 10 Seconds of Insane Courage. Anyone ever read this book? Okay, neither did I. I didn't read it either, but I just saw the title. <laughs> I saw the title and skimmed the back. Okay, it looked like a very good book. Okay, so I don't know what's actually inside the book, Okay, but the, the summary of it, I agree with. The summary of it is that you don't need a lifetime of courage to be great. You don't need a lifetime of courage. You just need 10 seconds of insane courage at various points in your life. So you don't need to be the most courageous, the boldest person in the world, but you just need 10 seconds of insane courage to pick up the phone, call her up, and ask her out. Okay, or you don't call or text her, ask her out, or tweet her, or swipe her, whatever it is that you all do but pick up the phone, risk getting rejected, but do something that is, for you would seem insanely courageous. We don't need to be the most courageous people for all of our life, but do we have the 10 seconds of insane courage at that moment in time when someone is being asked to do something that I would raise my hand and say, yes, I'll go. I'll sign up for that trip. I'll go to that mission. I'll do that. I'll volunteer. I'm all in. It doesn't, it's not a whole lifetime. You maybe say, I'm not a coward kind of, I'm a coward kind of a person, but the 10 seconds that are gonna define your life could be the 10 seconds where you say, you know what, I'll take that job, or the opposite, I will leave that job. Where you say, I'm all in, where you say, I'm all out. Where you continue, or where you end it, whatever it may be. You never know the fruit of what will happen 
from that courageous decision. Jack Canfield wrote a book and he talked about this. He said, everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. Everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. And as I'm saying this, I already know how you're responding. You're responding exactly how I would have responded or I would respond today or how I was, we all respond. There's two conflicting voices inside you. There's a piece of you that's listening to me and saying, yes, that's it. That's what I want. I want to be great. I can do something extraordinary. Yes, that's for me. And then as soon as that voice talks, the little friend on the other side says, but not now. Now's a tough time. Now you can't. Look at your calendar. Who's got time? Now is time for, what's this one? Let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. Do you know that praying about something sometimes is the least, is the most cowardice thing you can do is pray about something? And how many dreams of God died on the hill called fasting and praying about it? Because when God tells you to do something and God moves you to do something, you're not supposed to fast and pray about it. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to do it. I think of like, you know the little engine that could? The little engine that could? Okay, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. That's some of us, okay? That God gives us a challenge and puts it. We're like, I think I can, I think I can. Then we're like, and then we roll back down the mountain. And we're like, okay, let's circle them out one more time. We'll come back next year and we'll see. And I think I can, and then we, that's the way many of us are in life. And I hope that we can change that because like this guy said, everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. Everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. Think of the greats who did great things for the kingdom of God. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. Abraham, father of all nations. We all look at Abraham. Everybody looks at Abraham. Abraham, life came down to not a courageous life, but moments in time where he was afraid, but he took the right decision and he did it in boldness. Abraham is called. God came to him and said, I want you to leave your land, leave your family, and go to that land. If it was me and you, why? Why? Explain it to me. And God said to Abraham, no reason. He didn't tell him anything. He just said, said go. And if it was me and you, would say, okay, let me, again, fast and pray about it. Let me discuss it. Okay, let me, let me circle back in a year. Abraham didn't do any of that stuff. You know what Abraham did? Packed up his bag, went to a land. He had no idea the language, no idea the culture. And this was back then. This wasn't like, okay, go to Zillow and check out the homes in the area and go to Yelp and see. Like, there wasn't anything like that. There was no Google Maps. This was pick up, a, pick up your knapsack, everything that you can carry on, the, on your back, and just go west and see what God has in store. Ten seconds of insane courage. Moses, great Moses. Moses spoke to God face to face. Moses' life came down to God came to him and appeared to him and said, Moses, you're nothing. You're nobody in the middle of the desert. You have no sense, of, no purpose in life, okay? But I'm going to give you a purpose. Go stand in front of Pharaoh and say, let my people go. That's not an intelligent choice, God. There's better ways to do this. Let's go grassroots. Let's go with the people. Let's do a social media campaign. Like, let's, many things. Or send me with bodyguards or send me with an army. God said, no, 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 no. I'm asking you. A single act of courage. Moses, are you going to do it or not do it? And here's the important part. We know the result. Moses did not know the result. Moses didn't know what hung in the balance. Moses didn't know if he was going to come back the next day alive or dead. Moses did, and Moses certainly had no idea what God was going to do to that single act of courage, part the Red Sea and, and free the people and all that kind of stuff. And you the same way. You have no idea. You have no idea what hangs in the balance of your single act of courage. David, 17-year-old David. You know what 17-year-old means? 17-year-old means he just got his driver's license. 17-year-old David, all the Israel standing up there, and there's this big Goliath talking some serious trash, saying, y'all people, your God is weak. Y'all people are no good. And if you had any belief in your God, come down and face me. And they all said, we don't know what to do. 17-year-old David, snot-nosed kid David, little spoiled brat David, said, get out of my way. I want to take this guy down. David, you don't know what you're doing. David, you don't have any training. David, this is foolish. Single act of courage is what defined David's life. And you keep going on. Go Peter, walk on water. You go on and on and on and on and on. Find me any great man of God, Bible or non-Bible, and you will see that on the other side of their greatness, it comes down to a single act of courage. Okay, but your question is this. You hear all those stories that I just said. Go to Pharaoh, go to the giant, whatever it is. Where's my giant? Who is my Pharaoh? What's my challenge of faith? That's what you're asking yourself. 
Where's my giant? Who's my Pharaoh? What's my challenge of faith? Like, I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm not freeing anybody from anything. I'm not crossing any seas. I don't see any giants. Like, do you want me to just find like tall people and take them down? Like, what, what, what's my challenge of faith? I'm just a nine to five guy. I'm just trying to pass chemistry exam through summer school. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to get through and get my kids through school. Like, what's my challenge of faith? I believe this. I believe that God will give you a challenge of faith if he's not already giving it to you right now. But here's the important part. I believe that it will be less glamorous, but equally as defining. It will seem less glamorous. It'll be less box office. It'll be less in front of the whole wide world. But it'll be equally as defining. What I want to talk about today is I want to talk about three decisions, three challenges of faith that may be in front of you right now. And you say, maybe not. Okay, I, I don't know what it may be, but I'll give you these three and each of these three is going to seem so unglamorous, is going to seem so small, is going to seem so minuscule, but I promise you that that's the means by which God wants to work great things in your life and give you an extraordinary life if you're willing to be courageous in these three small things. And I say that based on Luke chapter 16, verse 10 and 11. God likes to do big things through small things. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I'm going to give you three decisions which you think are so small, so insignificant, but I promise you, like Moses, like Abraham, like David, you have no idea what may hang in the balance, and you may never know on this side of life what hangs in the balance of your willingness to take that step of courage. But I believe God wants to do great things through every single one of us. I don't believe it's just me. I don't believe it's any, just any person. I don't believe it's people just dressed in black like me. I don't believe it's just monks and nuns. I believe God wants to do great things to every person. But the doorway to get there is usually a single act of great courage. Three decisions. Ready? Let's go. Number one, the courage to fail when it would be easier to play it safe. The courage to fail when it would be easier to play it safe. Y'all know how it goes. Finish the sentence. No risk, no risk, no reward. No risk, no reward. The person who isn't willing to risk getting rejected is never going to find true love, is never going to be happy in their marriage. The person who isn't willing to risk failing will never invent anything great. The only way to do something great is to be willing to fail in the way. We've all heard this before. Abraham Lincoln, great president, lost 10 of the first 12 elections he ran for. But then he eventually won, and we're all thankful that he did. Dr. Seuss, written many books. His first book was rejected. How many times was he rejected before his first publisher, before he finally got published? 27 times. Rejected, 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 but kept on going. Thomas Edison, guy who invented the light bulb. How many failures did he have before he finally succeeded? More than 200 times. He said, I got a light bulb, fail. 200 times he failed. And someone once asked him, said, how did it, what was it like going through all that failure? How'd you stay faithful through all that failure? He said, I never failed once. I invented the light bulb in a 200 step process. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. He framed failure as part of success. And this is something that I believe in very strongly. This is like one of the, the like here at STSA, this is one of the most important things. I say it all the time to the clergy, to the staff, to the volunteers, I say it to everyone. We are not afraid to fail. We are not afraid to fail because if you're afraid to fail, you'll never do anything great. And you say, okay, that's easy for you, Father Anthony. You're a great preacher guy. You stand up there and everyone loves you. Father Anthony's the best, okay? <laughs> Believe me, I fail all the time, okay? And I can tell you stories about failure. And in fact, I got one to share today, which is very ironic because it's a failure that happened on this day in 2009. What's 2009? How many is that? 14 years ago. I'll tell you a, four, a great a story about the great preacher, Father Anthony, about how he gives the greatest sermons of all time. 2009, I was in uh, a city in England called Brighton. Have you ever heard of like Brighton Beach Memoirs? Okay, Brighton. And I was there for like a three-week trip, and I was asked to go there because, you know, whatever, the church was going through some tough times, so they wanted me to go and like, you know, invest in the community, whatever it is, whatever. So I went. And... The day before I arrived, the church went through a tragic event. Okay, so uh, uh, a father, uh, a husband and wife ended up uh, dying and like one killed the other and then committed suicide. 
And this was discovered when their uh, teenage children walked in the house and discovered they're both lying on the floor dead. So this happened the day before I arrived. So, or maybe two days before. So I arrived on Friday, or it happened on Friday. I think I arrived like Saturday. And then so Sunday morning. And it's the Sunday morning that's today. Actually, I remembered it when I looked at the gospel reading for today. So the liturgy readings that we just read from earlier today, okay, from Luke chapter 11, it was this Sunday. It was the first Sunday in June. So the readings were the same, and the readings were about the Lord's Prayer. Okay, you heard the gospel when Jesus said the Lord's Prayer. So they asked me to preach, and I am, okay, sure. Like, I'm here to preach, no problem. Two minutes before the sermon, two minutes before, the priest comes up to me, and he says, you're going to speak in Arabic, right? And I was like, uh, nope. He said, no, you got to speak in Arabic. I'm like, I don't speak Arabic. He's like, you got to speak in Arabic. I'm like, but I don't speak Arabic. He's like, but the sermon's got to be in Arabic. I'm like, then you give the sermon. He's like, no, you got to give the sermon. I'm like, but I don't speak Arabic. He's like, but it's got to be in Arabic. I'm like, okay, this is like, who's on first kind of a thing. Like, so he's like pushing, pushing, pushing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. But it's like two minutes till game time. And then all of a sudden I get pushed out on the stage. So there I am. And I got to preach in Arabic. And I know a little bit of Arabic, enough to be dangerous, and as I'll tell you in a second here why I'm dangerous I was. So I'm out there, and I'm preaching. And again, it was about the Lord's Prayer. And let me tell you what I wanted to say, okay? I'll tell you what I wanted to say. The Lord's Prayer begins with the words, Our Father. Okay, so I wanted to stress on the fact that God is not just the Father, but He is our Father. I wanted to stress on the word, Our that he's not just the father because these two kids lost their parents, okay, and like, where do we go? I'm thinking God is our father. We're brothers and sisters. We're a family. We're going to stand by them. We're going to stand by each other. Like, God, we're a family. Our. I want to stress on our. God is our father, not the father. He is our father. So again, I know enough Arabic. So it's our father. In Arabic, it's abena lezi. So in my mind, our Father's two words, Abanelezi's two words. So Abanelezi means our father. If you know Arabic, you know that that's not how it is. Arabic is the only language, okay? Every other language, our father, father in the Western is like one for our, one for father. In Arabic, Abana, the first word, means our father. Lezi means who art. I didn't know that. So I'm up there, and I'll tell you what I said, okay? And I, I said it in Arabic, but I'll say it in English. I said, God is not just our father. He's our father who art. <laughs> and I said, this word, who art, is very important. And I'm like, I'm giving them the business, right? Like, because I'm like, and I'm like, if you don't know who art, then you are not a child of God. Because who art is the most important thing. And who art and who art. And I'm, and I'm, I'm pounding it in their heads. And of course, I'm an idiot, okay? Because what I'm saying makes no sense. But the people, how are they responding? I never thought of that. He's right. I never heard a sermon. This guy's deep. This guy's deep. He just gave a whole sermon on who art. Of course, I finish the sermon. I get to the end. I think I'm, you know, the, the greatest thing, St. Paul coming, second coming of St. Paul. And the group that I was with from America who understood what I was saying, what I meant, was laughing hysterically and they explained to me the whole thing. But my point is to say, my point is to say, you got to have courage to fail in order to succeed. You got to be willing to fail to take a risk or else you'll never succeed in anything. So ask yourself, courage to fail versus play it safe. What is God calling you to do but you're afraid that you'll fail? What business God calling you to start? What step he's taking, asking you to take in your career? What person he's telling you to give a call to, or like I said, a swipe or a text or whatever it may be that y'all do. What, is it, what relationship is he giving, asking you to take the courage to end their relationship? Because you know it's not from him. Where are you playing it safe versus having the courage to fail? That's number one. The second act of courage is the courage to go when it would be easier to stay. The courage to go when it would be easier to stay. And again, my story. This is actually not my story. This is the story of STSA. For those who know, again, anyone who's gone through membership groups, you've heard me tell the story of how STSA started. When STSA first began back in 2012, I had been a priest for 10 years, and I had been serving at a large church out in, in the suburbs in Fairfax called St. Mark's. I'd been out there for 10 years, and everything was great. The church was growing. Okay, we had a school out there. I was in charge of the school. Like, everything was flourishing. Everything was great, but something was not great 
because God put something in my heart saying, go. And on the surface, go made no sense. Go made no sense because I was part of something stable and established and successful and growing. And this was very easy, especially at the time, like my, like my, my kids were like, I don't know, like three or four, whatever that age, like something very young. So this isn't the time to take a risk and start a church that's in a rented facility in a hotel where you don't know if you're going to have an income after a couple months. Didn't make any sense. On paper, everything said stay. But inside, God was telling me go. Because God put this thing on my heart, which said, you know what? The beauty of the Orthodox faith should not be limited to the culture. It should be open to any culture, any ethnicity, any language, any anything. And I was just so like overwhelmed by this feeling that God wants to do more. God wants to bring an ancient faith to the modern world, and he wants me to do something about it. And I'm like, God, but I don't know. And I but God was very, very clear. Paper made no sense. Inside, God was telling me to go. And just to show you how much it made no sense, at this time, people would come to me, okay, other priests, even bishops, would come to me and say, I heard you're leaving. Come to us. Like, come be part of our church. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's not a matter of I want to go from one church to another. It's, it's like God is calling me to do this. And they're like, okay, yeah, but I mean, and I'm like, no, 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 like, th this is something like, I I'm excited to do this. One priest, no, 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 no joke, came and said, I want to meet with you. There's a priest from somewhere else. He want to meet with me. And I said, okay, you know, whatever. And we met in the office, and we're sitting across the table from each other. And he's like, you know, Father Anthony, you know, you're very talented and you're very skilled. Come serve with me. I'm like, no, see, you may not have heard. You're like, you may have heard that I'm leaving here, but you didn't hear, like, I'm excited to do this. We're going to start something that's going to be great, ancient faith, modern world. And he's like, okay, this is what he said. He said, I know, Father Anthony, sometimes we do things because we want to, but sometimes because we have no choice. I'm like, no choice? No, this is my choice. I'm not getting kicked out. Like, they're trying to keep me. I, I, I'm doing this because I want to. I'm excited. And he did, no joke. He pulled out a business card out of his pocket. And he goes, okay, you know what? I'll just leave this right here. <laughs> And he slid it across the table. I'll just leave this here and feel free to call me anytime. And I'm like, I don't get it. That was 11 years ago. Here we are now. STSA is 11 years old. We're in our tween years, I guess. We're an awkward middle school phase. <laughs> we have more than 500 members. We have three priests, two locations, one mission. Ancient faith in a modern world. That the beauty of Christianity, ancient Christianity, is not limited to any culture, any spiritual background, it's for all. Christ is for all, Holy Spirit is for all, church is for all. We are about to open a building in one of the most prominent areas in the country, mile and a half from the Pentagon, right off of 395 with visibility, and to this day, I still don't know how we're able to do that, how we're able to pay for it, because I don't know where the money came from, but somehow it's there. And what I want to say is as I look back on that, I look back on that decision. We do, uh, like I said, we do a membership group a couple times a year. And every time we do membership group, I like to get to know the people that are joining, especially those who are getting baptized or chrismated into the faith. I like to have lunch with them. I like to hear their stories. It's my favorite thing. And let me tell you some of the things that I hear when I, when I get to know people and their stories. I hear, if not for this church, that's what I hear. If not for this church, okay, then I'll fill in some of the blanks. People say, if not for this church, I wouldn't be in any church. I've heard, if not for this church, I wouldn't be reconciled with my father. If not for this church, I wouldn't have come back to God. My favorite one. If not for your church, the person said your church, but it's our church. If not for your church, I wouldn't be part of the church. And I hear those stories, and I see it. And I'm always thinking to myself, like, some people are motivated to do great things. Me, personally, I'm actually not motivated to do great. I'm motivated to not regret failure. Okay? I'm motivated that the things that could have been. I hear those stories, and I think to myself, what if I never made that decision to leave? Like, what if we never started STSA? And I think to myself, again, it's great, thank God. But what if I played it safe? What about that person whose relationship with his father? What about that person that they're married? What about that person in their relationship with God? What if, what if? And for me personally, I believe this. You, you may be different, okay, but the way I'm wired, I don't think you'll regret the risks you take as much as the opportunities you miss. That's what I always think. I can't imagine 
getting up there and knowing that I could have done something about and I was too afraid to do it. That would eat me up. I don't know what it is for you, but I guarantee you, your moment will come. And like I said, for some of you, it's here now. Some of you, it's here now. Your moment is here. Your giant, your Red Sea, your act of courage. What are you going to do about it? Maybe we frame it differently. Maybe it's not an act of courage. It is an act of courage. But what it is is an invitation to do something great in this world, to be extraordinary. But the only way to get there is an act of insane courage. So number one, the courage, single act of courage, is often the difference between an ordinary and extraordinary life. Act of courage, number one, courage to, play, to fail versus play it safe. Number two, the courage to go when it'd be easier to stay. And the third act of courage is the courage to confess when it would be easier to pretend. And I'm talking to everybody in the room here, everyone on the other side of this camera. I'm talking to everyone, but I'm especially talking to a certain group of people, the men. And the reason why, this applies to everyone, but men in general, obviously it's general, we struggle to admit we need help. We struggle to confess our mistakes and our shortcomings. Women, it's easier. We, easier for us to pretend. And I'm going to tell you something that I heard a long, long, long time ago. I remember I was at a conference and someone said there's certain two sentences that came from this conference that stuck in my mind. I'll never forget them. The first one, this is for every single person. You're only as healthy as your secrets. You're only as healthy as your secrets. And the longer you've had a secret, the longer you've had something in there that nobody knows about, the longer it's just between me, myself, and I, the longer it's been in there, the more unhealthy you are, the more danger that you're in. The second thing that was said at this conference was said, and this is speaking specifically to leaders, but I think it applies to everyone. If you have a secret, you are leading with a limp. Okay, let me explain what that means. He said, if you have a secret, you're leading with a limp. In other words, you have something that you are compensating for and you are hoping that nobody sees. You can't run. You can't jump. You can't, you can't fly. You are leading with a limp and you're hoping that nobody sees and you're pretending that nobody sees, but I got news for you. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows. The only person you're hiding it from is the person in the mirror. Everyone else sees it and they can tell something is off with you. Something isn't right. Something you're hiding, something you're overcompensating, something, something is off with you. And maybe the most courageous thing that you can do today is to admit it and to confess it. Say, I need help. I can't win this on my own. And I realize that's scary, and I realize there's consequences. I realize that. But I promise you, I'm going to put this up on the screen here, and I, I, you won't take a picture to whatever it is, but I promise, just listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. You may not need it today, but I promise you, for the rest of your life, remember what I'm about to say. The consequences of concealment are always greater than the consequences of confession. I promise you. The consequences of concealment are always greater than the consequences of confession. may not seem that way, but I promise you. Sometimes... I get asked for advice from new priests. Someone gets ordained as a priest and give us advice. And you know, they want you know, something spiritual and something whatever it may be, and my advice is always the same. Never stop confessing. Never stop confessing. This is the idea that once you get to a certain point, you don't need to confess anymore. That's not true, that's not our church. Our church says that even the Pope confesses. And the Pope doesn't have to confess to another Pope, okay? Confess to a simple priest, doesn't matter. The issue isn't who you're confessing to. The issue is that there are no secrets in here because secrets are unhealthy. Secrets are dangerous. Secrets are cancerous. Everyone, that's why I tell priests, never stop being accountable. Never stop admitting you make mistakes. You know you make mistakes. So if you're not admitting, it doesn't mean they're not happening. Like, this doesn't solve any problems. This doesn't make the problem go away. Only thing it means is you're never going to solve it. Never stop being accountable. We've all heard the story. You could fill in the blank. I don't even need a name because there's a million names. The great leader, the great, the great whoever it was who had a great following and his story was great. And then all of a sudden we see this great fall because he had something and he kept it secret. Nobody knew, couldn't see it coming. And then all of a sudden we think, 
oh my goodness, this great person, this great rise, and then this, all of a sudden, he fell. And I promise you, there's no such thing as all of a sudden he fell. There's no such thing as all of a sudden he fell. That's just what we see on the outside. The truth is, the leak was a slow leak. There's very rarely an explosion. There was a slow leak that was left alone. A slow leak, nobody look at this. A slow leak, they just, just, just hide, pretend it's not here, pretend it's not here. And then you see the destruction, what we see at the end. But I promise you, several people saw the fall coming. Several people saw the fall coming. But that person refused to admit it. The consequences of concealment are always greater than the consequences of confession. And why I'm so passionate about this now, and like I said, I'm saying especially the guys, I want to read you a text message that I got just th this past week. And obviously, I'm not going to say the name, I'm not going to tell you the circumstances, but I'll just give you a, a, a rough, a high level. This person, who is a man, had a secret, hiding it for years, everything good on the outside. Those closest to him sensed, suspected, but nobody said anything and he pretended everything was fine. Then all of a sudden, as you can imagine, 100% of the time, what happens? A huge explosion. Because secrets don't say secrets for long. Explosion affected his home, affected his career, affected his family, even his family is not even right here. I sent this person a text message, just asking about him, how you doing, whatever. And I'm gonna read quote exactly what he said. I said, how are you? He said, I'm on and off. I feel the happiest and most free I ever felt in my life because finally I'm free from all the filth and sin I was living in and was feeling trapped. But then I also feel the most pain I've ever felt because of the pain I caused others. I'm going to read that again. I feel the happiest and most free I ever felt in my life. The person whose life is now destroyed because I'm finally free of the filth and sin I was living in and feeling trapped. But then I also feel the most pain I ever felt because of the pain I caused others. I then responded and encouraged him, you're doing a good job, stay close to God, God won't leave you, I'm here to support you, whatever, whatever, whatever. He said, thanks, my wife and kids got the worst of me for years, and now that I'm finally clean, I can't wait for them to experience the best of me. I can't wait to be the father and husband I was meant to be. I hear that, and like you, part of my heart breaks. Part of me breaks for what happened to this person and his family and his career, my heart breaks. But I gotta be honest, a part of me celebrates. A part of me rejoices. Because if he can pick the pieces up and his family's willing to walk with him to pick the pieces up, this would be the best thing that ever happened to him. Because he said it, it's not my words, he said it. Now I can finally be the dad God wants me to be. Finally be the husband God wants me to be. The consequences of concealment are always greater than the consequences of confession. I know it doesn't seem that way, but I promise you, if you got a secret, if you got a secret, confess, admit it, get help. Sounds scary, but every single act of every extraordinary life, every life of greatness begins with a single act of courage, and it may be 10 seconds of insane courage to go to the priest and say, I did blank to go to your spouse and say, I did blank, to confess. But everything that you want in life, I promise you, is on the other side of that. That's your Pharaoh. Stop looking for Pharaoh. Stop looking for Goliath. If you got a problem, and it's a secret, that's your, act of, that's your challenge of faith. That's your Pharaoh. That's, don't tell me I gave money to the homeless guy outside. I'm a great person. I do these things, I put money in the, in the money basket. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me I fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Don't tell me any of that stuff. You want to be great, you want to be obedient, confess, admit it, ask for help. And it may be the most significant thing you ever do. And I know that's a scary thought, but let me give you a verse right here to hopefully help you. James chapter four, verse six says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know what grace to the humble means? Grace means power from above. When we admit, when we confess, when we humble ourselves, you are inviting God, you are opening a door to heaven. Okay, right now you're living this life and it's just you because you got these secrets, so everything is closed. You admit, you confess, you say the scary words, I need help. What happens? A big door opens to heaven. And now all of a sudden, the grace and the power from above 
is now able to work in your life. Before that, it's been closed. And it's just been me, myself, and I, and do your best, and good luck to you. But when you open, when you humble yourself, all of heaven is there to support you and get you through. The courage to admit and to confess when it would be easier to pretend. Those are the three acts of courage. And because I'm in a good mood today, I got a fourth bonus one for you. I got a bonus one for you. You ready? The bonus one, courage. The courage to do something when it'd be easier to take a picture of the screen. The courage to do something about what I'm saying versus pull out your phone and take a picture of the screen. Some people actually have pulled out their phone and took a picture of that screen. Some of us, some of us are professional note takers. Professional, professional quote collectors. Professional screenshotters. And our phone is filled with them. And our journals are filled with them. And we never do anything. We write it down. We tell everyone how great that sermon was. And we do the same thing next week. I want you to do something about it. Which of those three decisions is God stirring in your heart? The courage to fail when it'd be easier to play it safe? The courage to go when it'd be easier to stay? Or the courage to confess when it'd be easier to pretend? Let me ask the same question in a different way. When all is said and done, you've heard me ask this question before. This is how I make a lot of decisions in life. This is how I think you should make decisions. You ask yourself this question, what story do I want to tell? What story do I want to tell? When all is said and done, what story do I want to tell? What story do I want to tell my kids? What story do I want to tell my grandkids? What story do I want written about me in the newspapers? What story do I want said at my funeral? Do I want my story to be? He knew he needed help. Everyone knew he needed help, but he was too scared to admit it. You want that? Do you want that your story? Do you want your story to be that God gave him a gift and God gave him the ability, but he was too scared to do anything about it? He'd rather play it safe versus take a chance. What do you want your story to say? Like I said before, what haunts me in life is not, I want to do something great. What haunts me is God put something great in front of me and I missed out on it. And I'm going to live the rest of my life with that regret. That's why I like to take risks. Because I can't. That feeling, maybe I just seen too many people on their deathbed with regrets. Regret, my goal in life is to avoid regret. Other people, like I said, you're much more pure than me. You want to do something great for the kingdom. Me, I want to avoid God bringing me this and say, I put that right in front of you. I gifted you. I brought you right into place. I brought you that sermon from that funny preacher on that, that, that screamed at you. I've got everything for you. I laid it out for you. But you were too afraid. That eats me. That kills me. I never want to think, what if I trusted God? What my life would look like. What if I took a chance? What my life would look like. What if I admitted that I needed help? What could my life look like if I just said, I got a problem? For some of us, enough is enough. Stop taking pictures of the screen. Stop writing down. Throw your notes away and do something about it. For some of us, it's time to go home today and go to our fear and right in our fear's face. Stick our finger in it like that and say, enough. Fear is not going to control me anymore. Fear is not going to control me anymore. I'm going to take a step of courage because I know that the difference between an ordinary and extraordinary life is often one single act, one single act of, act of courage. And in case you need a little extra motivation, let me tell you a passage in scripture that you, every time I'm a little scared, every time I'm a little, I go to this passage. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's the story of David when he went down into the battle with Goliath. Big old Goliath. Nine foot tall Goliath, scrawny little David, Ar with armor and weapons and whatever it may be. And a funny little kid who got five little stones and a little sling that he stole from Bart Simpson's store, whatever it may be. And he went down, this is what he said, 1 Samuel chapter 17. He said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. Ooh, big scary sword, spear, and javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel whom you have defied. Boom. He says, you come to me with weapons. you making me scared. You're scared of all those people. I got something more scary than all that. I got the name of the Lord of hosts who created heaven and earth and all things that are seen and unseen. And he's on my side. I ain't scared of your sword. I ain't scared of whatever it is you got. It goes on. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Look at the confidence. And I will strike you and I will take your head from you. Say this to your fear. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know 
that the Lord is a God in Israel. That's how you talk trash to your fear. I'm going to feed your stinking carcasses to the bird. That's how you do it. Then the, all the assembly, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. Say it with me. For the battle is the Lord. Say that with me. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When did David say this to Goliath? After he had killed him? After he had decapitated him? After he had taken his sword? He did it when Goliath was in all his glory. And everybody was scared of Goliath. Everybody was scared. In other words, David said this when he was in imminent danger. Not like danger tomorrow, not like danger next week. Like if I say these words, this guy gonna come down and break me in half and put half of me in this pocket, half of me in this pocket. He could do that. Single act of courage. An insane act of courage became the defining moment of David's life. My question, what about you? What's going to be the defining moment of your life? An act of courage or an act of fear? I said in the beginning, we aren't in danger of ruining our lives. We're in danger of something much worse, of wasting them. Because as I said at the start, being part of the kingdom of God, think less country club, think more army. Less about, like, membership has its privileges. I get to come here, have the nice food, get my parking validated. It's very nice. That's not church. Church is being part of an army. Church is being part of something. And doing something great. And being called to be extraordinary in this world, because that is who our master was. I'll leave you with this thought. Fear and courage are both speaking to you today. Fear says this, you don't know what you're getting into. Courage, you don't know what you're missing out on. Which voice are you going to listen to? Fear, you don't know what you're getting into. Too risky. Courage, man, you don't know what you're missing out on. My hope and my prayer is that we today, God would reveal to us that single act of courage, and through that, we would see the great things that God wants to do. Because I would rather fail a thousand times in obedience and in faith than succeed out of fear to the bad guys. Let's stand in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, and that we, Lord, have nothing to fear in this world because you are with us, Lord. I pray that you would help every single one of us first to identify what that single act of courage that you're calling us to, that challenge of faith, and not to see it as, as, as fear and challenge, but see it as opportunity and an invitation by you to do great and to be great in this world. That's the deepest desire of our heart, Lord, to be used by you to do something great. So I pray you'd give us all courage. Fill us all with your courage, Lord, to take that step today. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Here, says we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.